purposes. So that was a long winded introduction. Uh, Dirk, did you want to add anything? I apologize for kind of stealing a lot of that time there. No, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, you covered it, particularly mentioning um, our medical technical focus area. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. No problem. Okay, so with the balance of our time, I'd like to ask Lindsay um, or introduce Lindsay. And Lindsay, I'll ask if you can maybe give a, an overview of yourself and, and, of course, your topic as you're getting into this presentation. Okie dokie. All right. Okay. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, the webinar this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Brian and Dirk, for, for having me. Uh, we're excited to talk about the program today. Um, I am one of the program analysts at the Joint Trauma Analysis and Prevention of Injury and Combat Program. We're just going to go with Jay Tappick for the rest of the time here. Um, and just a note about me, um, so you can sort of understand the pers a perspective behind this presentation. Um, it really, uh, my two areas of interest do um, coincide very nicely with the joint presentation with survivability and the biomechanics of that, which is my undergraduate focus, and I'm a clinical nurse specialist by profession, so I am uh, come from an understanding of the effect of severe injuries on service members. I worked in orthopedic trauma unit at both, both Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center and Walter Reed National Mil Military Medical Center doing dismounted combat trauma. And, you know, uh, after some years seeing how well we were able to care for the population post-injury, I really began getting interested in let's prevent this all together. Um, so that's how I found my way to JTAPIC, and many of the JTAPIC's uh, subject matter experts that we work with every day have some sort of similar experience, whether they were, you know, a combat medic or whether they were, you know, serving uh, in a support uh, role, you know, they, they have those experiences, such as mine, that have kind of shaped how, the how and why of JTAPIC. And so, in short, JTAPIC takes traditionally stovepipe information streams, integrates them, and creates operational analysis products for, you know, DOD stakeholders, whether it be a combatant commander, or senior leader, a material developer, vehicle designers. Uh, we provide them with uh, information so that they can bolster their survivability and improved outcomes for deployed warfighters and the, and the support elements. Um, to understand a combat event completely, you need to understand that it is unique, each one is different, and it's a multifactorial uh, occurrence. And JTAPIC will strive to present a holistic interpretation of what went well and what could be improved, and then we provide this information. Um, and, and we hold it also for aggregating studies over time to identify trends uh, to inform both dot mil PF and material solutions. So that's sort of my little introduction, and I see that you moved on to the next slide, so that's good. So um, prevention is our mission. Our actual mission is to facilitate collection, integration, and analysis of injury outcomes, material performances, and operational intelligence data to improve the understanding of vulnerabilities. Okay. Um, JTAPIC was established what, uh, in 2006 as a result of the NDAA. Um, the Secretary of Defense designated it down to the Army Medical Research and Material Command, which is now the Medical Research and Development Command, uh, to support the executive agent. And one of the things that is if you steal somebody's slide, you assume their um, typos. So it says DOD education activity. It's actually DOD executive agent uh, for blast injury uh, research. And um, we, in accordance with that directive as part of that EA, we were tasked to develop, in a, joint, develop a joint database to combine the medical operational intelligence and material data elements and then establish these relationships across the disciplines uh, so that we can share the outcomes and represent each community of interest equally while we put an integrated product forward. So um, we have been named a non-material enduring capability. We have the military command authority exemption so we can ex expedite uh, sharing of personally identifiable information and health information. Uh, when, when we say we integrate the data, we 
identify the casualty. We abstract medical records to find out about injuries. We link that up with the operational context of what they were doing per the reporting. And then we look at the threats and the, the, the enemy tactics, t techniques, and procedures, right? So that requires identified information. Uh, and, and we do have an exemption so that we can use it a little bit differently than most folks do. Um, we also know that the traumatic brain injury is a signature event or signature, you know, injury of the past two major contingencies, and JTAPIC is charged with the collection of and tracking of potentially concussive events that not only means concussions, but um, if a service member is within 50 meters of a blast, if they were in a vehicle that was affected by a blast, they had a rollover, they got a bonk on the head, you know, we collect all of that information uh, to make sure that they're getting the appropriate treatment. And then also on the back end, we work with the Veterans Benefits Administration to help assign disability claims. Um, a lot of times the JTAPIC information uh, collection wheel is the only place that somebody will have a record of having been exposed to many, and uh, most of the time multiple blasts. Um, so we can kind of help them out on the back end. I mean, the, the ethos of the, the warrior is that they just keep go, keep on keeping on, uh, and they don't report that stuff because they don't want to be taken out of the fight either. So, you know, we kind of help them on the back end. And then uh, finally, we had a charter signed um, in 2013, and it, it just describes our responsibilities um, with regards to uh, mitigating blast injuries. Moving on to the next slide is our partnership. We are a virtual matrix organization and um, we are governed by the program management office. That's where I work. Um, and we are now under the futures command. And uh, so we've had to undergo some changes as everybody has as the futures command is, was stood up. Um, our partners, so the program management office really handles all the planning, programming, budgeting, and execution activities. We handle all the RFI requests, product development, and release, and the information systems that we use to do this. Uh, we have partners across all services. Um, typically, they are the three disciplines I keep mentioning, medical material, ops, and intelligence. Um, but if we need uh, another partner to help um, an entity answer a question, we will certainly go out and get that. Um, I will also add that I think we ha have added another partner from the information technology uh, realm, and I'll get into that here uh, shortly. Our medical partners, uh, you can see the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System. Uh, they provide us with all of their killed in action injury data, so cause of death, mechanism of death. Uh, we receive um, ballistic evidence removed at autopsy, and we do analysis on that and hold that um, in, in a chain of custody type situation. Uh, the Joint Trauma System, they provide us with wounded in action injury data and medical coding typically from the Role 3 military treatment facilities. So um, if somebody has, and, and that's where you see your, you know, that's the, the DOD trauma registry. They have many, many um, ways that they are looking at trauma care delivery. We work very closely with them. The Naval Health Research Center also provides us with wounded in action data and, and coding typically from role one, so your battalion aid station, your role two, um, and the role two capabilities certainly depend on, you know, where, where what the posture looks like at the time and where the, the location of the role two is. Um, so we, we get that information uh, from them. Also, um, another medical partner is uh, USARL, the United States Army Air Medical Laboratory. They do all of our accident-related uh, incident analysis. So, um, you know, accidents occur uh, in theater even though they're not driven by a hostile uh, action by an enemy. So we do look at those. We also um, work with, uh, through USARL, um, we work with the Joint Aircraft Survivability Program and the Joint Combat Assessment Teams, and they do um, the aviation-related incidents. Now, um, we've all been working through probably some funding decrements as the things are changing around us all the time. Uh, so we have the, the program management office, you know, we have medical cell here as well. And so, 
as as our ability to fund some of our partner efforts decreases, you know, we've taken on a lot of the casualty identification and the traumatic injury coding here, so we do have some redundancy uh, at this time. Uh, our material partners, uh, we use um, the Program Manager Infantry Combat Equipment from the Marine Corps and PEO Soldier, their, indiv uh, their individualized equipment group. Now they're called the uh, Program Manager Soldier Survivability. And they collect and analyze any damaged PPE uh, from soldiers killed in action, died of wounds, and occasionally wounded in action. Um, and they 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 run our our damage re PPE return program. They keep all of that stuff warehoused down there. We CT scan it, we X-ray it, we try to um, correlate that with injuries uh, so that we can you know let people know. How, how our PPE is doing, and, and that's, that's those guys down there. Um, our other material partner who we rely for some pretty heavy lifting is the Combat Capabilities Development Command, uh, the Data Analysis Center. Formerly, uh, the group was um, ARL Survivability Lethality Analysis Division, and uh, they collect all of these um, fragments from our various partners, so they um, they do me metallurgical analysis on them. We use mass spectrometry. spectrometry I can't even say that. Um, they maintain our forensic custody of the fragments in the physical evidence database, which is something that we uh, we have available. We we think it's a great thing. It may be a little bit underutilized, so we're trying to get that kind of out um, out for people to know about that we do have fragments from all sorts of combat events that we have analyzed and the data is available. So the uh, Data Analysis Center, they also um, do comparative analysis for us between combat data or combat events and live fire tests. So we'll say, hey, this happened in combat and they try and recreate it or they have done something in live fire and we try to see if we can match those things up to see, um, you know, if, if the modeling and simula simulation is working well. So we, we do ask a lot of them. Um, and lastly, our Ops and Intel partner, um, we use the Marine Corps Intelligence Agency and the Operational Analysis uh, Director down at uh, Headquarters Mix, uh, USMC in Quantico, and they provide a lot of force laydown information and operations uh, analysis subject matter expertise. Um, for the day-to-day for the -day work on collecting the information, the operational and intelligence data on all of the attacks against the U.S. warfighters, we have a combat incident analysis team that is down at Fort Benning. Um, they have a lot of uh, EOD, uh, special operations experience, and um, they're, they're doing a, a lot of the... Um, the products that we're putting out in a fast turnaround. Uh, so we, we do require a lot of heavy lifting from our partners. And then lastly, the National Ground Intelligence Agency, we rely on them for threat identification, attack scene investigation, battlefield vehicle forensics. They do all of our foreign weapons analysis. Um, they do evidence analysis in conjunction with the medical and material partners. And they currently house our JTAPIC database. Um, we are not going to be developing that any further. We have a transition plan. Some of the um, privacy funding related issues that I've, that I've mentioned have kind of uh, put us to a point where we're going to have to, uh, to make some changes. And so I mentioned their information technology partner is uh, the Engineer Research and Development Center. Um, their information technology lab, they're helping us with our new information system to manage all of these data streams. So we have all of these partners looking at all of these things. So we have a lot of data and it's been disparate for a long time. We've gotten close to getting it manageable, but we would like it to be seamless. So um, that's sort of our partnership at a glance. Uh, next slide, please. All right, um, a lot to read on here, but primarily what does JTAPIC do? I've, I've pretty well told you about that. You know, we just look at any casualty causing incident and see what type of information we can pull uh, to help mitigate the next mission, injuries in the next mission or the next group of missions or the next contingency, you know. So um, we have been capturing this information since 2006, and what 
does it really do? And I'll get into some examples, but we, we provide context for future requirements. We have been doing a lot of direct action group engagement. So those people who are getting outside of the wire and doing the work and having things happen to them, uh, we have been interacting with pre-deployment training, post-deployment debrief, after action reviews. We uh, have been developing our SOCOM partnership primarily out of need because they're the, they're the folks who are going out there doing the direct action. Um, we identify trends. We do a lot of um, validation of test parameters for live fire testing. So we say, oh, hey, you know, here's, here's what we're seeing in terms of injuries. Well, actually, we got a sandwich. The, uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so we provide them with instrumentation recommendations. We try to work with our international community to make sure that um, the allied partner, partners that we go out with, they have similar standards for body armor or similar standards for collection and analysis of, of evidence so that when we meet on a world stage, we're talking about the same thing and we've done similar so that, so that they're relatable uh, to make the, the aggregate information stronger. And then we use these records over and over again. We change the queries for different problems so we can help a, many different communities look at a problem from their perspective, integrate, let's say if it's the medical perspective, we say, hey, well, the, you know, the material that these folks were wearing did have, uh, you know, a, a large portion of, uh, uh, they had a, a large, uh, I guess, relationship with how the injury went down. So um, it's, it's really just, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but we, we look at information from multidisciplinary perspective and answer the questions that are asked of us. Um, so the next slide, slide five, the, where does JTAPIC information go? Okay, so this is just a quick snapshot. You can read it um, of some of our fis uh, fiscal year 19 activities. We do a lot of cross-functional team support, uh, the ground combat systems. They um, asked us to look at every hostile event against a ground system. Uh, and organize it an analysis product by threat so that they could prioritize their data collection and their threat algorithms for the unmanned aerial systems that they're using. They're saying, okay, well, um, we're going to have this system out here, and what what did their payload need? You know, what does what does that payload need to be to be able to counter any of the threats that we're seeing? So um, we, we provide that information. Future vertical lift. Uh, we're doing actually a four-part series. We've done the Black Hawk and the Apache. We're moving on to the Chinook and the uh, Kiowa Warrior, uh, looking at all of the casualty-causing incidents or shoot-downs uh, to provide to the future vertical lift CFT to help them in uh, you know, their acquisition cycle uh, of risk reduction and te technology maturation. You know, For the most part, the, the saying goes, if it's flying, it's okay, but if it goes down, there's something bad that's going to happen, uh, so we're trying to, to take some of the risk out of that. Um, we find ourselves in the requirements development phase more often now. Uh, when we were doing a geographical proximity analysis for special operations when special operations casualties occur, and we found that you know there's this, this pretty consistent trend that really points to the need for a lethal ground-based sensor. Uh, so we put that through the CTTSO, the Combating Terrorism Technical Support Office, got a requirement pretty quickly, and that's out for procurement right now. Um, I mentioned the current operations incident report. Every casualty causing incident gets a full look from the moment that the contact with the enemy started until everybody was exfilled. We look at everything. We look at medevac times. We look at point of injury care. We look at... Um, data that says where people were standing. Um, we look at the Facebook of the enemy who tells us, you know, what the plan was that day. I mean, we will find any type of information to try and put the, the picture together. Uh, and we send that out uh, every time 
Uh, we just did a big, obviously there was a big event that happened in uh, January with some missile strikes. We have looked at that pretty comprehensively um, from a medical perspective, uh, some, op some operational, uh, it was an attack on a fixed installation, right? So um, it's a little bit different than what we usually do, but I do have, um, we, we have been providing uh, the, the TBI analysis. It, it seems to be pretty fluid. People are coming in even weeks, weeks, weeks later uh, having some, some issues, so we keep update, updating that product and send it out. Um, I mentioned the Special Operations Partnership, pre-post deployment engagements. We do reflections, share lessons learned. Um, if somebody's going in or coming out of a geographical area, we'll pull everything that we have and send that out there so that somebody, you know, for example, you know, if there's a lot of uh, thoracic injuries in an area, you know, the medics can be ready to be plussed up on all of that stuff. It, it takes um, takes some of the the unknown out of it when we can provide them with that information. And then again, I mentioned the technical cooperation program about standardizing um, personnel protection measures for our allied nations. Uh, next slide is going to be uh, slide number six. Not only do we uh, try to save lives when when we can, uh, saving money and time is uh, uh, also something that, that we like to do uh, when we can. A uh, couple examples here, the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, they were post milestone B, they had some money, they wanted to do one of two things. They wanted to either put electronic stability control or an engine compartment fire suppression system. Um, we were able to uh, provide them with some data that says, hey, you know, the JLTV has a lot of qualities of the Humvee, a lot of qualities of the MRAP class, and you know, there's a high probability of rollover. So, you know, uh, here's the information that we have, and, and, and they decided to, before full rate production, they, they put that uh, ESC system in there and saving tons of money on a proposed retrofit uh, by, by kind of getting it in there right before, um, you know, the, the full rate production occurred. Uh, we work a lot with the body armor. You've heard me say that a number of times throughout this. Um, one of the things that we see is, you know, musculoskeletal injuries, they're kind of not very glorious, but they occur, occur at a rate twice that of any combat, uh, you know, hostile fire type injuries. And um, that really tends to wear people down, but obviously we, we want to decrease the body armor weight, but we can't compromise survivability. So we took all of our damaged PPE, we looked at the injuries behind it, we did some um, analysis and we were able to say, hey, you know, we probably can give a little bit on, on the, the weight without compromising um, the survivability. And so um, the, the, back face, the permanent back face deformation requirement is being changed. Uh, we sometimes provide the op operational context to clarify a, a, you know, a single perspective. For example, um, clinically, clinically, a group was presenting with something uh, that inferred that maybe the material wasn't performing well. There were some inhalation injuries that it looked like it might be um, the MRAP fire suppression system. Um, the doctors saw a lot of this in a short period of time, but of course, when you're a physician or you're a medical provider, you take care of what's in front of you. You don't necessarily know uh, the back end. So we were able to provide the context and, and sort of slow the roll on, oh my gosh, we need to pull all of these things out of theater and redesign them immediately. So um, we said, hold on, hold on, here's the whole picture. And they said, okay, all right, now we don't really necessarily need to um, adjust the life, life cycle modernization schedule. We don't need to do something immediately. We can kind of going uh, rather than investing a whole ton of money for something that really was was unnecessary once you looked at the whole picture. And then um, one of the things we hear a lot about is burns. Um, burns, when they happen, are horrific. Uh, if you look at the burns in the large scale of injuries, they don't happen very often. But we were saying, hey, you know, what is the, the requirement for flame-resistant garments? Uh, so we looked at those who suffered a thermal injury, we organized them by what they were doing and their occupational specialty at the time to really kind of pare down what the actual needs are. So um, you can see that we, you know, we are working uh, with the NSRDEC and developing 
the, uh, the capability development documents for all of these systems, the fire-resistant fire ACU, combat shirt, combat pants, and all down through the, you know, jungle uniform efforts that I have list, listed there. So, you know, obviously we, we're most interested in prevention or mitigation of injury, but we can save money and time. We like to do that too. All right. Um, slide seven, uh, kind of getting down to the end of it here. So I'll just go really quickly and then we'll just have questions after this. All right, our source data is anything that we can find. We use the combined information uh, data network exchange, it's classified safety center data, personnel system data, medical record system data, trauma registry data, Facebook, soft specific platforms, anything that we can find that has information about a particular event. Our partners will filter through that data and they will pour, pick out the relevant elements and then they will put it into what I would say if you are looking at the slide, the second level, the blue computers, I would consider that to be like our partner level. So that data goes into where our partners' um, databases at their, at their organization. So the Combat Incident Database, that's at INJIC, the USRL, the Safety Center, the JASPO, the ISR is the Surgical Research Institute, um, that's where the trauma registry is held, the NHRC has the Expeditionary Medical encounter database, the AFMES has their KIA database, the, then I mentioned the PPE, and then our physical evidence database. So all of that information then eventually gets pulled into the JTAPIC database. Now that's been a manual function for a really long time, and um, some of the new data sharing limitations that we have with the um, standing up of the Defense Health Agency have broken some of those arrows. So the data flow has been severely limited. Um, one of the benefits of being around and doing this longer than the organization to, you know, now regulate what we are doing, we had to um, kind of reevaluate, get some data sharing agreements, memorandums of understanding. So the, the good news is we can do what we still have to do, we just need to modify it. And again, I mentioned the funding, um, everybody's taking funding decrements to continue to do the same things. So um, we're just having to find new ways to do that. Um, slide number eight, the next slide. So the, G, the JTAPIC PMO information systems include those um, five on the left. So the JTAPIC database, which encompasses all of that stuff from the previous slide, um, the JTAPIC analysis and collaboration system, um, that is where you'll find our product library, our RFI analysis request system, where anybody in the DOD can ask us a question and we put it through our, to our partnership and we you know, try to do some minimal metrics on, on that for performance improvement. And then we have our concussive exposure reporting system, which as I mentioned, we report the concussions for tracking. Um, then our physical evidence database, mentioned uh, that we do all of that work on whatever we can collect. And then the combat incident analysis team down at Fort Benning, they are currently holding the majority of our integrated data from 2017 to 19 as we spin up our new information system that Erdic is helping us with, and that's the Jinx system. Um, so I mentioned the funding. For those um, on the left there are in different locations under different lines of effort, and it costs way more than it needs to. So we're streamlining it all into the Jinx system, uh, which will um, incorporate all of these things, hopefully. We're on to the next slide now, just to talk about Jinx briefly. Um, it's gonna be hosted on both non-classified, the Nipper and the uh, secure protocol router, the SIPR networks. Um, most of the medical stuff that we do is, you know, based on, well, PHI and PII, which is special information, but classified as FOUO. Um, but when you add that to all the threat and vulnerabilities, obviously that becomes a classified piece of information. Um, but we need to operate in both NIPR and SIPR, so we will have a cross-domain function so we can go back and forth as required. Um, we are using the DOD PKI infrastructure certificate for access control. Uh, so anyone with a DOD um, CAC with that PKI certificate can um, come into the new system. We're working 
Uh, we, we know that there are other federal agencies, non-DOD, who may have use for things like ballistics or, you know, geological mapping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're trying to come up with a way that we can make it work for, for more than just the, the DOD, but um, that's, that's in planning. Uh, our RFI module will be in there, so all of our project management, any, um, anybody who would like to in, uh, interact with JTAP would just come in through here. Product library, all of those products that we've done before will be there. The SIPR database, of course, again, everything will be integrated into the records there. And one of the things that we really wanted to do was get these an analytical tools uh, together with the data. Sometimes you want to analyze something and you don't have the tool to do it without going out to a whole other place and then it, just to have it all in one spot creates the efficiencies that we're looking for because we pride ourselves on fast turnaround time for operational analysis so that combatant commanders and vehicle designers have the information that they need so that they can make better survivability determinations. Um, and and that's, that's probably, for me personally, what I'm, I'm most excited about is having the tools to do the analysis right next to the data. And then a full metric suite. Um, one of the things that was sort of limited in our previous stuff is we didn't, I, like I know that for me, the critical pathway in any of our projects is getting this disparate data into a usable data set. Um, and I can say that until I'm blue in the face, but I don't have a metric suite that helps me with the numbers. So um, that's going to be in there. And then uh, slide 10, just the conclusion is, uh, you know, we have a lot of historical information. We collect daily information. We will look at any problem that anybody has. If there's a combat data um, element that that you would really need for maybe uh, what you're doing, but it's not something that we collect, we, we, we will go and add that to our fields and we'll start collecting on it and then we'll do what we call legacy data because we're always having people going back and updating and getting the information that we missed. Um, and then providing the, this as near to real time as we can to uh, help with survivability and then provide these lessons learned to the next generation of folks who are going to need them. And I mentioned the JTAPIC system, the new one. We're going to finally get all of this information and analytical tools next to each other so that um, our analysts and, and any person who wants to come in and has a good justification for using our data can come in and analyze it and, and come out with what they need to, to answer their questions. We want to employ the highest standards of data protection and again, create efficiencies for our users. So that, JTAP has been around for a long time. We do a lot of strange stuff, I suppose. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about it in just a half hour. Um, but uh, my contact information is on the, the last slide. Uh, we'd be happy to discuss any, any questions one might have. Um, thank you very much for your time and pending questions, I'm through. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. And um, again, just want to emphasize, if, you, if anyone does have any questions, there's that, that chat feature box. You can just type them in there. I don't know how many folks are dialed in um, to ask them audibly. You're certainly welcome to do that as well. But if you type them in, then we'll just um, speak them over to Lindsay, and she can kind of answer them as best she can. I, I'll ask a first question, Lindsay. Um, how much is JTAPIC doing proactively for analysis? You mentioned a lot of kind of uh, capabilities, so you can kind of be quick and quickly reactive. But um, you know, what are you guys doing to, to put information out there uh, proactively? We we push a lot of of products. Um, we have really been geared to look at what has happened, not necessarily what might happen. That would be more of a the, the core mission of some of our our partners. We have to be pretty careful. Well, we've had to um, make sure that we are not stop, stomping on their, their core mission. So if you're asking me, uh, like, for example, if it's intelligence, like what are the foreign weapons systems out there, like I wouldn't answer that question. Right. That would go directly to a partner. When we see something that's maybe a cross, a cross of – the disciplines, that's sort of when it comes to us. I wish we did more proactive. Gotcha. Okay, no, that's fair enough. Thanks.
If anybody else has any other questions, again, the chat box there for we'll kind of sit tight for just a minute or so, see how get any other questions coming in. I'm not sure if you can see the question there, Lindsay, but uh, do you publish any of your findings to a wider DOD audience? Um, like the DTIC? Yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, that would be one way. I, um, we should. <laughs> that's, that's, we, we have our library. Um, a good number of our products are, the majority of our products are, are classified secret. Sure. Um, so what I think we need to do is maybe put the awareness of JTAPIC out there more. Um, you know, that need to know thing gets to be kind of pesky. So right. <laughs> if we want to, you know, there's some information that we can put out there, but the majority of it is, is really not for the wider DOD audience. Uh, now, are they are they available though? Some of the products, if they if anyone can log into the Jinx system sure. with their DoD PKI, okay, so it's kind of searchable or reviewable that way. Right. So you can so and and we are maintaining our old system so that that top address that's up there, the JTAPIC um, you can go there and our product library is available. You can search by abstracts hmm. okay. and. We just when if you see one that you like, you you know you click on it to download, and it's going to ask for a justification. Right. So um, we're pretty, um, you know, all of these things have distribution statements on it, and what you can and what you cannot do. So we're, we're pretty liberal with how how we do disseminate information. I don't okay. think we've ever said no. How about that? <laughs> Uh, another question that came in here. Do you, do your analyses result in changes to operational plans? Um, yes, we have had a lot of reports, particularly now since we're having a, a much uh, more frequent contact with the mission planners for, let's say, the Ranger Regiment or whatever. Uh, we'll see that they're like, oh, hey, um, and I'm talking about like mission operational plans. I'm not sure if that is the actual intent of the question, but uh, alterations in tactics, techniques, and procedures for the next mission out, absolutely. And you, you might have asked, uh, answered this already, Lindsay, but are you are you guys looking at injuries? Um, just from incidents like accidents or attacks, or you mentioned kind of um, skeletal injuries, you know, muscular injuries from just maybe, you know, the heavy body armor. Do you guys still look at those kind of injuries as well? So that is typically done through the, like the Armed Forces, Armed Forces Health Surveillance Branch. Um, that's, that's who has traditionally done the, the musculoskeletal injuries, but we come across them all the time and we pull them down. And we're getting to the point where uh, we're looking at not just the combat injuries. We have them cataloged, but I haven't necessarily gone in and coded them for their for ankle sprain or lumbar strain or something like that. Okay. So we we have the capability to do that, um, and we have the data sort of sitting there. Um, but primarily, uh, the the AFHSB has been doing the musculoskeletal stuff. So so we haven't really tapped into their lane to do that. Okay. Oh, thank you. Any, any other questions from anyone on the line? Hey, Brian, this is Dirk. I was wondering if I can get a question in over the phone line. Please. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to the presentation. Um, was able to follow it, uh, I think, pretty well uh, without slides. Uh, would do the IT problems on my end, but so I was wondering about um, you know the casualty causing incidents, um, you know, and and how you're looking to collect data uh, from those events. And so I'm wondering how recent does an event have to be that you're able to start collecting 
data, start going after material or information. Because uh, the one that comes to mind for me right now is last month's um, you know, Iranian missile attack on the our air base in Iraq. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, recently we're hearing in the news about uh, the traumatic brain injuries that uh, the service members suffered. So, is that too recent for you to be able to start collecting data and and uh, trying to get uh, you know useful information out to combatant commanders and stuff, or or is that actually the exact kind of stuff you're going after? That's exactly what we go after. So um, that's. That's one that we we got sort of uh, we started the the day afterwards and we're still getting different. Uh, I updated our analysis yesterday. Um, it, it it changes from the initial event to even a month out for this particular one. We're still updating it, but yeah, I have a full full TBI. Um, medical analysis on that. It's unclassified. Are you interested in me sending it to you? Uh, I certainly am. Thanks. Yeah. I, I'll send it to you. But yeah, we, we start, we get a casualty, a daily casualty report. If the event happens and it's reported in intelligence sources and it's during business hours reasonably, we get started on it right away. So nothing is really too recent, unless it's the weekend. Yeah. Uh, great. Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll make sure you have my email address. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would, I'm excited to, to send this out. It, it's a unique event in the grand scheme of things over the past couple, couple con- contingencies. Yeah, and then Lindsay, how many um, how many RFIs or requests do you get from folks in the community on a like kind of what's the rate of that? Um, maybe in terms of a month or in terms of a month, uh, full fledged RFIs we used to really be be um, have most of our resources tied up on one or two RFIs at a time before. Now we're finding that we're having more quick turn RFIs, which is just a, just a couple questions here and there. Um, I think we've done about 192 over the past two years, three years. Okay. So 192 handful. pull out analysis, but we answer questions all the time. A lot of times we answer, we're answering simple things like frequencies. Mm-hmm. How many MRAPs were hit with something? Because somebody wants to put that in a, you know, in a paper or something like that. We do, we, um, we tend to support research in its infancy, mm-hmm. you know, to see if, to help um, maybe an idea get over that, uh, what is that called? The gap between S&T and R&D. Valley of death. The valley of death, yes. You know, so does does a prob- does this combat problem happen to one person or 100,000 people? Like that's we'll find ourselves answering questions like that all the time. Got it. Okay, thanks. Lindsay, one more question from here. Um, who, who is your who is your audience for these questions? Are they researchers or are they operational guys, policy people? Um, we. Help policy occasionally. The questions that we get primarily are from material developers. Um, how many? An example would be: uh, We're going to go to a different iteration of helmet. We may lose a centimeter on the bottom of the helmet. How many GSWs to the head around the, the, you know, the ear or neck, you know, how many of these things would we potentially, you know, sustain if we don't have that area covered? Same thing with the body, the, you know, the plates, the side plates, the back plates. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, well, we'll bump it up again at the end of our time. I think we've asked a lot of good questions to you. And Lindsay, thanks for, for fielding them all and walking us through everything. And again, if anyone does have any questions, Lindsay certainly has her email and contact information there. The JTAPIC link is there. Um, and again, I mentioned HDIAC and, and DSIAC as resources that you can reach out to um, to help answer any questions as well. So, Lindsay, appreciate your time and look forward to any future conversations you might have. All right, sounds good. Thank you, everyone. And please, please reach out. I, um, I look forward to uh, meeting new folks and, and having a new arena to explore. Very good. Thank you. All right. Take care.